You know, there's a few disciples in there that is really hard to preach on because there's hardly any verses where they're mentioned. And uh, I don't remember how I handled those particular ones, uh, but that makes it kind of difficult. And so as I'm reading through John here, I found it real interesting that in all of the gospel accounts, the, what they call the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, those three are very similar. And in all those gospels, the apostle um, Philip is only mentioned one time, and that is in a list of all the apostles. Okay, So all 12 apostles are mentioned, and so therefore Philip is in that list. But we don't read anything about him coming to the Lord or anything particularly that he did. We just see his name mentioned one time. Now, there's another Philip, the brother of Herod, who's mentioned, but that's a different Philip. In the book of Acts, same thing. Philip is mentioned. Now, another Philip is mentioned, which is the evangelist or the deacon. Uh, there's a lot said about him in the book of Acts, but as far as the apostle Philip, he's only mentioned in a list with all the other disciples. Not much said about him. So I found it really weird as I'm studying the book of John. And last uh, Sunday, the message was about how John doesn't even hardly, he doesn't name himself at all. He just talks about himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He doesn't mention his brother James, and there's a lot that he doesn't mention. But I found it interesting, even though all the other uh, gospel accounts don't mention Philip except for one time in a list of other apostles, John actually mentions him on four separate occasions, and there's a total of 11 verses that talk about uh, about Philip. Okay, now, um, originally, I was going to preach a message, and I forgot to tell uh, Brother Austin that I changed it, but that's okay. Uh, the title of the message was going to be Philip in the book of John, and I was going to go through all those different occasions where he's mentioned, okay, throughout the, uh, the gospel account. Uh, but instead, I decided to just focus on his call into the ministry, okay? That's kind of where that, this study led me. And so I've changed the title to A Call to Full-Time Ministry, all right? Uh, it's, it's a little different than where I was originally going, but I think there's some stuff that we can learn from the calling of Philip in particular uh, that could help us in terms of this call into ministry. And I realized just right away saying A Call to Full-Time Ministry uh, gets some people worked up, and there's debates out there, and there's a descript, you know, there's, there's different I don't want to say arguments, but there's different opinions as to how somebody's called into the ministry or, or are they, is there some kind of calling or, or what the case may be. So uh, I understand that. I acknowledge that, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that and what I mean when I talk about call, a call into the ministry, and what I mean when I talk about full-time ministry. Okay, We're going to look at some of these things, and, uh, and hopefully, hopefully everybody in here can get something out of the message, but particularly young men. Uh, who might keep themselves open to the possibility of what we used to always say in the independent fundamental Baptist circles as surrendering to full-time ministry. Okay, that's just a, a thing that has, has been said for quite some time, and, and uh, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so number one, the first point I want to make, and uh, this will be the longest point. The other two points would be pretty pretty short, but uh, this first point that I want to mention is that a call into the ministry is a difficult thing to explain. Okay, Everybody you could talk to who considers themselves to have been called into full-time ministry, again, I'm going to explain that here in a minute, but they'll give you a different explanation as to what that calling is, what it looked like for them. And there's a couple things. We don't want to project onto other people a calling because it's what happened to us and say like, well, if this didn't happen to you, you know, let's say somebody hears a voice. I don't know anybody that has ever claimed to hear an audible voice, not in the Baptist circles anyway. Uh, but let's say somebody did, it would be weird for them to project onto everybody, well, you're not called into the ministry unless you hear an audible voice, right? And so the same is true. That's a radical example, but if you take that down a little bit, like, well, you never felt this burning inside you, like, I must preach the gospel, I must preach from the pulpit, I must preach... Uh, you know, if you didn't feel that, then you must not be called. But throughout my life, in a lot of churches I've been to, a lot of ministries I've been involved in, like there's been a lot of talk about that as though this is something that people have to have is this call, you know, this urgency in their life to preach the gospel. And I think it's there. And I can speak from my own 
uh, my own life experience that I feel like I had specific callings in my life to certain things uh, that the Lord put upon my heart, but I can't project that onto everybody. But uh, trying to explain somebody's call into the ministry is, is definitely very difficult, okay? However, as a pastor and as somebody who is, is aging in the ministry and in life and, and recognizing that, hey, there is a future in Christianity, a future of Baptist churches, future of our old Baptist temple even, There's a, there, there, there is a need for there to be a calling of young men into what I'm calling the ministry, okay, full-time ministry. And I find that to, I find there to be a great challenge in doing that. And so I've, I've recently, and not everybody in here is on social media, and I understand that, and I wouldn't pressure you to be, but, uh, but I put stuff on there a lot. And recently I, I had this thought in preparation for this message is where it came from. But I had this thought about young men, um, or I should say older men trying to preach messages to call young men into the ministry. Now, when I grew up, this was something... Uh, uh, okay, the altar call, you know, I don't know how many of you, there's a few people in here that I knew grew up with altar calls, and uh, some of you have never been exposed to that, okay? Uh, it's an exciting thing. It's, it's, it's interesting. It can sometimes be a sensationalized thing, but uh, there are usually, let's say, maybe three main measurements of altar call. Like, um, so if you don't know what I mean, like, they would play the music, sometimes thousand verses of the same thing, song over and over, uh, just as I am. It's like, come oh, on, well, let's go to another song or something. And, and just waiting for people to come down to the altar to make a decision, okay? And a lot of pressure would be put on that. I'm not entirely against altar calls per se, uh, but I'll save that for another message, okay? Uh, but ultimately, I have chosen not to do them, and I think I have some pretty good reasons for that. But w- growing up, there was always a push to get people to come down and to make a decision. And unfortunately, a lot of preachers kind of base the success of their message off of how many people came down. So if you talk to somebody that went to a preacher's meeting and say, hey, how did your, how did your engagement go? How, how, did, how was the, the preaching? They're going to often measure right away like, oh, great, man. The altars were full. We had this many people get saved. We had this many people like that. That is the, the scale by whether or not they did a good job preaching, okay? And that's, you can see where the danger is there. Uh, that's one of, the thing, one of the reasons I shied away from that. Um, maybe I didn't, want, I didn't want to tailor my messages for that reason. And then also, like, I didn't want to be pride. I didn't want to have to get, I didn't want to have to battle pride if I preach a message and everybody comes down for it to the altar. Like, I feel like that would, that would mess with my pride a little bit, okay? Uh, that's just some personal reasons. But, uh, but the, the measurements were usually how many salvations, you know, hey, so this, this person came down to get saved. Um, how many people, like, sometimes they would say, like, rededicated their life, okay, meaning, like, I, I got out of the will of God, and now I'm coming back to rededicate my life, and that I'm not going to live that way anymore, and I'm going to serve the Lord. And then another one was a surrender to ministry. Like, those are pretty much the three I might be leaving some out, but those are the three basic things somebody would come to the altar for. So, you know, altar workers would have a card, and they usually would have those things for them to check off. Like, why did you come forward? You know, I just want to get right with the Lord. I want to, and so they say, okay, dedicate, I mean, uh, uh, rededicate to the ministry. I uh, just, you know, or if they came forward and make a profession, you know, I get saved. I'm tempted to go on a rabbit trail here. <laughs> you know, I probably already have too much, but uh, I'll preach. I'm sure that'll come up again in a message sometime. Okay, uh, and so this call into the ministry is uh, something that a lot of preachers will strive to uh, make the point of their message. Okay, uh, you have to understand if, if you if you have any experience preparing a message, there has been a push in times past that if you get up to make a message. Everything that you do in preparation for that message should be the altar call. Like this is a this is a common teaching that's out there. Okay, so everything you're doing is leading up to that altar call. So you want everybody's undivided attention, and you want to work them towards that final invitation so that they could come up and make that decision. Okay, and some of the problems that you have with that is 
the manipulation of that. And, and of course, that's one of the reasons why churches don't bring children into the congregation, though. You got to have them in their Sunday school classes because we want everyone that's there, no distractions, undivided attention, so that we can kind of walk them through this um, emotional. And I, I'm not, I don't even mean to say this in a negative way, but this emotional roller coaster that's going to lead them up to the end and say, wow, what a great message. I must go forward and dedicate my life or whatever, okay? And so growing up in certain, you know, meetings where there's like revivals or camp meetings or uh, uh, children's camp or even, uh, man, real big time in, in like youth rallies and stuff like that, where a lot of young Christians who grew up in church, you know, well, they're already saved, you know, a lot of them already obeying their parents and all those kinds of things and trying to live for the Lord. So, so the preacher is not going to push towards salvation if that's his audience. He's not going to, I mean, they always do an altar call, like leave it that open for somebody to come forward and get saved. But uh, they're not going to push rededication for everybody. But they're going to know that a big portion of the kids that are there, they grew up in a Christian household, they're living. But they're going to push them to make a decision to come and dedicate their life to full-time ministry. Okay, so I'm just giving you the background of where I grew up and, and what I'm uh, used to, you know, when it comes to preaching and messages and stuff like that. Now, a thought crossed my mind that if it's our job as, as kind of older people in the ministry, I uh, feel weird even saying that about myself. I still feel like I'm a young guy, but the reality is, you know, I always think about this like, Jesus died, died when he was 33, like his public ministry was only three years. And here I am, 46. I'm like, I'm 13 years older than Jesus was when he died. I'm old, okay, let's just say it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but the older guys in the ministry, you know, who can't do some of the things that the young guys do anymore, like our job is to raise up a new generation of people who are carrying the torch and are going to do those things, you know. And so we want them to surrender. and We want them to be willing to follow the Lord full time, and uh, sacrifice whatever they need to sacrifice and, and make uh, whatever commitments they need to make to be able to serve in the church. Now, we understand that everybody has seen probably the demographics and heard people talk about how churches are declining in, uh, in numbers. You know, how many people go to the, are attending churches, is, it's going down. And yet you look at the mega churches and, and, uh, all around the, the country and, and, and even the world, and some of those are packed out. You know, we're talking about like like arenas. Like, you know, it's, it's like going to the, the football game, which, by the way, I just saw something, something that said uh, there's some maybe a record. Is there a football game today? Maybe it's today or yesterday or something like that. There's some record as like this is the coldest that they've ever had. Um, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like there's some record saying that like right now or whenever this game is like the coldest temperatures where they're actually having a game or something like that. I don't remember. And if you look at the pictures, like the stadium's full. And yet I can't tell you how many people I saw online saying, hey, because it's so cold, we're not going to have services today. And or, or they did have services, but people were like, oh, come on, this is too ridiculous. I'm not getting out in this cold. Now, look. I'm not trying to judge people that for some reason they couldn't get out today. I'm just saying that hey, people don't have a problem making themselves go to a football game or some kind of big thing that they want to go to. And, uh, and so we'll kind of do the things that we are dedicated to and that we want to do. But what do we have to do to get people to want to surrender their life to ministry? Okay, well, what is ministry? That's going to be the big question. Because historically, in those sermons that I sat through that really uh, tried to convince people to surrender their life to ministry, now, yeah, there's a lot of talk about people sacrificing and a lot of talk about people quitting their ambitions and their uh -huh. desires and, and the things that they wanted to do with their life. They had to give those up and they had to follow the Lord. But you know what? They always pointed to men who were very successful. Don't you want to be like the next Spurgeon? Let's not talk about Spurgeon, okay? Uh, <laughs> not a fan, but he's somebody who a lot of people would point to, okay? Spurgeon was a very successful preacher. So, you know, you tell, you know, the whole, remember the old song, uh, mamas don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys? You know, like, hey, mamas don't let your babies grow up to be pre preachers and pastors and stuff like that. Some ladies have that feeling, like, why would I want my child? I want them to be lawyers, and I want them to be doctors and all this. I don't want them to be preachers. But if they hear the story of Spurgeon, they'll say, okay, my son can be a Spurgeon. 
Why? Because Spurgeon made a lot of money. <laughs> and he had large congregations coming. There were billboards. People would pay him to advertise of all things, their cigars, <laughs> you know, or something like that, because he was a well-known name. He was a household name. Everybody knew who Spurgeon was, and he made lots and lots of money uh, off of the ministry. And I'm not judging his motives even on that. I'm just saying he was. He was a successful preacher. D.L. Moody is another one who, by today's standards, he was a multimillionaire, and he, and he traveled around doing evangelism with a... Uh, uh, a song leader who was, uh, uh, you know, again, the times, this was a very important thing. Like you had these revival meetings and you had these great singers who could get people singing out and all this. So Ira Sankey uh, he wrote all these songs and he performed all these songs. So he and um, D.L. Moody put out this songbook. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not criticizing that, but they put out the songbook. That songbook made by today's standards millions. And so anytime you hear like, oh, well, uh, you know, they gave all this money to this thing or to that thing, or, you know, they didn't receive money from, uh, from this church whenever they went there or something like that. Well, that's easy to say when you made millions off of your songbook or something like that. But ultimately, the stories that are told are, hey, don't you want to be like this preacher, that preacher, made lots of money, had lots of success. The story goes on. I mean, you know, Billy Sunday, Billy Graham. Oh, I want my son to be the next Billy Graham, you know. Hopefully, you guys don't want your children to be the next Billy Graham. But what they mean is somebody who's successful and he's a household name and everybody knows him and everybody likes him and he makes lots of money. Joel Osteen, you know, and, and people like that. But if you're going to call people into the ministry using the biblical examples, when Jesus says, follow me. Now, yeah, Jesus is a household name and Jesus' ministry was successful, but did he make a lot of money on this earth? No. He told his disciple, hey, come follow me. And by the way, I don't have a, lay, a place to lay my head. You know, hey, come follow me, and you're going to have to give everything up for me. And even your family is going to turn their back on you and hate you and all these people. You're going to do all that, but follow me. It'll be worth it in the end, right? Not popular in this day and age where everybody is looking to the NBA. I want to be an NBA star. I want to be the next, uh, uh, you know, football player. I want to be the next uh, uh, rock star, you know. Now, there's a lot of people who, who sang specials in churches because they liked the attention that it got them, and they took that talent that they have, uh, that, they, that they got from performing in church, and they took it to American Idol or something like that, and they became huge stars. A lot of famous stars were, they learned how to sing in church, okay? But people, that's successful. That makes money. That gets fame. Everybody nowadays wants to be like the next... Uh, um, uh, what do you call it, content creator, you know what I mean, or something like that. They get famous and professional and make lots of money and stuff like that. And look, if that's their job and that's how they're making money, I'm not knocking that. It's not wrong to have money. But what I'm saying is how do you call people into full-time ministry, hey, sacrifice, you know, your life and all the stuff, you know, and follow the Lord full-time. What do I mean by full-time? I mean, like, that's what, you're, that's what you're doing for a living. Whether you make money or don't make money, like, you're just, like, giving it all to, uh, to the Lord that's a hard thing to call people to do because there's no fame in it. There's no, you know, they're, they, they, they want stardom and they want promises of all these great things and success. And so it's hard to call people or ask people to, uh, to give to that extent. Look at Matthew chapter 20. Verse 16. I'm not going to labor on the context here. I just want you to see this concept that Jesus uses and, and, uh, and think about just what it says, just at face value. Okay? So the last shall be first and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Look at chapter 22. Verse 14. For many are called, but few are chosen. You know, what exactly does that mean? Many are called, you know, but only few are chosen. Is that you're talking about election? Are you talking, is that like some Calvinist thing where, you know, God's going to just choose certain people? And, and uh, um, you know, of course, I don't believe that. But <clears throat> what does it mean many are called? What, what does it mean? How does somebody receive this calling 
from the Lord to give their life to full-time service. Um, well, here's the thing. All I can say is this. If you have received that call, and I know many people have testimonies of receiving that calling right, to full-time ministry. If you have received that call, you know that you were called. Okay, you felt that in your life, and you knew that, and you knew what God had called you to, to do. Can't explain it. It's not easy to explain, but you just know that you had that call. <clears throat> now, what if somebody says, well, I don't know that I've actually had a call. I never had a moment where I felt some calling on my life or something like that. Um, well, here's the deal. We all should be ministering, <laughs> okay? And here's where it becomes kind of a controversial to talk about being called into the ministry because every single one of us is called into the ministry if you're saved. Every single one of us has a calling on our life. We have a vocation to which we are called, which is serving the Lord, preaching the gospel, you know, uh, uh, helping to be a light to the world and all these kinds of things. That's our calling. That's our vocation. And so obviously everybody is called into ministry, but that doesn't mean everybody's going to be starting churches, leading churches, serving in the churches on a full-time basis uh, where that's, you know, they rely on that for... Uh, uh, for their income, their livelihood, and, and they just kind of keep serving the Lord with their life, uh, like maybe the Levites did in the Old Testament, or, uh, you know, there's lots of uh, examples of that. And here's the reality. If they did, let, let's say everybody here, we got saved, and so we said, you know what, let's just all just go full-time. Like, I don't care what your job is, just drop your job, and just let's go serve the Lord full-time, just knocking on doors and, and uh, serving different, in different capacities. Well, here's the question, like, who would support us? <laughs> you know, if every Christian did that, like, who's going to support them? Is the world going to support it? No. So obviously there seems to be some kind of system where, you know, there are some people who are, are full-time and then there are other people who are working and uh, that money is being used to help fund the full-time workers. And, and yet everybody's doing their part and they're being involved as they can. Like, this is uh, the reality that nobody is exempt. Well, it's not my calling. You know, hey, you want to go soul winning with us? Well, that's not my calling. You know, no, nah, that's not how it works. Like we're all called into full time service. It's just some people have decided, hey, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I have no other ambitions. I'm not trying to uh, do any other thing except serve the Lord uh, with, you know, to whatever the greatest capacity that I can serve. Now, I, I, I personally, just by way of testimony, because there are some people that are going to be like, what's that look like? How do you know? Okay, I have had lots of calls um, personally in, in my life to ministry. You know, I've shared some of these before, but I'll share them again because this is what it looked like to me. Now, it's hard to define, and I wouldn't expect this to happen to everybody, okay? But uh, when I was like nine years old, you know, I saw myself like one day pastoring being, or, or, or one day preaching behind a pulpit. Let's put it that way, okay? I saw myself like being involved in ministry and serving the Lord, and that was my, my, my motivation. Now, that's nine years old. sounded good, but I remember getting a lot of criticism from like the older kids. You know, hey, what are you going to do when you grow up? I'm going to be a preacher. You know, and they'd be like, why did you decide to be a preacher? Well, I feel like God called me to be a preacher. Really? He called you to be a preacher? What's that sound like? This is an audible voice like, Rocky, you're going to go be a preacher one day. <laughs> you know, I've called you to go into the uttermost, uh, whatever. I couldn't explain it to people. So I just had to endure the ridicule <laughs> you know, and say like, hey, I don't know how to explain it, but I just know that God wants me to do that with my life. And I kept that in the forefront of my mind. And so as I went through my high school years and, uh, you know, obviously you get involved in high school and you find some things that you like to do and that becomes your ambition. Like I wanted to be a full-time artist, you know, and I wanted to be a baseball player and, and all these things. And I had those ambitions, but in the, in the now back of my mind, because I tried to move it in the back of my mind, I knew I was going to serve the Lord with my life beyond just like, well, I'm going to go to church as often as I can and I'm going to try to tell people about Jesus. You said, that's what some people would do. They'd be like, well, I don't mind serving the Lord, but can I be a famous athlete and serve the Lord? Like, like Tebow or, you know, can I be one of these guys, you know, where I have this huge presence and everybody's like, oh, I want my son to be just like that. And isn't it so wonderful how he professes Christ and, and he, he gives all the glory to God. And look, some people even don't like him for taking a knee and, and all this stuff. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like full time. Like, I'm not going to be on the road traveling around to the to the uh, 
football games and stuff like that. I'm going to be traveling around, you know, preaching and doing what the, you know, whatever I can do in the church. It's hard to talk people into doing that, but I remember as a kid knowing that that's what my call was. And so I had to give up on all my other dreams and ambitions to some degree. Okay. Later on, I uh, surrendered to the mission field. I said, this is it. God's called me. I'm not going to go and I'm going to spare you the details of how I felt called to do that. All right. But uh, I felt like the Lord was leading me. I'm going to be full time, uh, but I'm going to go in the mission field. And I'm going to, you know, learn Mandinka and go to Gambia, West Africa. And, and I want to talk to uh, these people. And, uh, and, and, and so I had a preacher that said, you know, here's what I think you should do. I think you should go to Bible college. And, and uh, he began to explain to me some things that were about that Bible college that were going the wrong direction. But he didn't know where else to send me. And if you just go there, uh, you know, maybe you'll find the answer and you'll get the training that you need. And so I went and the Lord led me to a good church, you know. There was some problems with the school, you know, but there was also some good things that I got out of the school, I guess. But uh, ultimately, I do feel the leadership of the Lord was on my life during that time. But I was just searching, Lord, what's next? Where do I go? How do I know? How do I become a, a preacher? You know, and I'm just doing what I was told and what I thought I had to do. Ended up feeling like I was led to another Bible college, uh, mostly just to get. I felt like I needed to get away from the one college, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, and then, and then ultimately, this is many years later, the Lord uh, spoke to me in a particular way that I that I should go work with Brother Collins, who had asked me to pray about coming and working with him at Iowa Baptist Temple. And I can't really explain, or I could explain. I could tell you all the details of how I felt those callings and how the Lord worked in my life. But at the end of the day, it's my word against anyone else's. And you say, well, wow, maybe you were just, you know feeling something different <laughs> you know you're just maybe you're just like reading into that or it's what you wanted to do and I tell you for sure that we didn't want to go to Iola like that was not in our in our minds uh but uh but that's where Lord 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 sent us okay <clears throat> now again this point I said this is gonna be a long point the next points are gonna be short a call into the ministry is difficult to explain but but how do we know? How do we get that calling? How do we know that the God's called us to do something? Look at verse 42. Okay, We're back to John chapter 1. And look at verse 42. You know, let's just for uh, to make it a little easier, let's start with verse 40. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. We know that the other one was John. He just doesn't mention himself. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and uh, Andrew did, and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is also Peter, okay, which is by interpretation of stone. I added the Peter part, okay, but it's, it's true. <laughs> it means Peter. Uh, it's the same guy. Verse 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, follow me. Now, I read this. It's kind of like that word findeth just jumped out at me. And I'm just like, that's interesting. Could you imagine your name being in the Bible? And it says that Jesus came and he found you and he said, follow me. Like he had this plan and purpose in your life that you're going to be one of the disciples. You're going to follow Jesus. And he came and he found him. That's, that's quite a statement. You find that nowhere else in the Bible. Like John mentions this, but you didn't see it, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All of a sudden you see here, Jesus sought him out. Andrew and John are following Jesus. You know, and other gospel accounts talk about their calling. Uh, but it just says they're following him. And then all of a sudden it says he found Philip. Okay, and this is really interesting. What does that mean? Like if, if I'm trying to make a point that says like, hey, God's going to find you. If he wants you in the ministry, he's going to find you. Because that's what some people say. Even when, I made that, even when I made that Facebook post about how hard it is to find people and, you know, they got, they're starstruck and they're, and they're wanting to be superstars and all this stuff. But you're trying to tell them to surrender their life to full-time ministry and, and, hey, you're not promising any glamour or anything like that you're just in fact you're saying probably most likely you're not going to have the dreams that everyone else has you're not going to have great riches you're not going to have lots of fame people are going to hate you <laughs> so you're telling people that and trying to get them into the ministry 
And somebody commented on there, and I understand where they're coming from. They said, hey, well, if you're called into the ministry, you know, then you will go, you will surrender. You will, will go to the ministry. Well, that's not true. Because I have met a lot of people in life who know God called them into the ministry, and either they just didn't want it, and so they, so they chose not to go, or they kind of messed up, fell into sin, some kind of sin that, that like hindered them from being able to be a part of what they thought that God had called them to do. And, uh, and that's just the reality, that everyone in here has a free will to decide whether or not you're going to follow the Lord. You can't just, not like you just got the special calling and election upon you and just, I can't help it. I'm just going to go preach. I'm just going to go be a pastor one day. Like, I can't help it. No, that's not how it works. Okay, if God puts you in that, gives you that opportunity, you still have to make the decision whether you're going to do it or not. And you have to make the decision that you're going to keep yourself qualified to be able to do it. And, uh, and so, still, though, it, we see this word, Jesus did come find Peter. And I would say this, um, you know, you, you could say, like, I don't know what, I don't know what, uh, I, think, I think I said Peter, I meant Philip. I don't know what Philip did for a living, but I know that James and John were fishermen. Peter was a fisherman. Uh, so a lot of people talk about the disciples being fishermen. So, you know, what, what could up my advice be to somebody? Well, you know what? Just serve the Lord however you can. Stay faithful to church, reading your Bible, doing all those things. And whatever your profession is, just do it to the best of your ability. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. Do it as unto the Lord. Uh, you know, you can say, hey, keep fishing. Hey, keep working for your father's business, whatever it is. You know, that's what Peter, that's what James and John were doing, working for their father's business. And keep doing that until the Lord opens the door and shows you, hey, this is what I got for you. But he's going to find you. You see what I'm saying? Like, I could make that. And I could, uh, there's there's a re good reason to, um, to say that. But at the same time, not everybody has that same testimony where, hey, Jesus, I was just walking down the street and Jesus found me and said, hey, follow me. Right? <laughs> Not everybody has that testimony. In fact, uh, I'll show you here in a little bit that, uh, uh, that some of the disciples didn't, weren't even called in that same fashion. Okay, but the second point I want to make is this. Some people have a desire to, do, to, to be in the ministry. Okay, and I'm going to particularly talk about the bishop, the pastor, the elder, okay, because uh, that's typically what we think about when you think about full-time ministry. And some people have a desire to do that, and God knows their heart. God knows they have a desire to do that, and He knows if they're capable and ready, to, uh, willing, to, uh, uh, able to do that. But look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. And it goes on. But here's the thing. There have been, there are a lot of people who have this desire to be a bishop or a pastor. They have a desire, but it just, it's just not happening. I've heard a lot of people say, like, man, I have this desire, I want to be a pastor, and, uh, you know, nobody's, like, ordaining me or, or whatever the case. Uh, for some reason, they just haven't been given that opportunity and they haven't come. You know, well, here's the thing. What if somebody's not apt to teach? What if they just haven't proven themselves to be apt to teach? Whether it's on them because they haven't done the work and the study and the, plan and the you know, got themselves to where they can teach, um, or, you know, let's say that they aren't the husband of one wife. You know, that was on them. They're the ones that, you know, or maybe it wasn't. Maybe, the, maybe they couldn't help it. And, uh, but whatever the case, like, they're not qualified to do that now. But they have a desire to do so. Well, there's a lot of people out there like, well, at least they have the desire to do so, so let's put them in there anyway. But, like, that's not how the Bible lays out this office. Um, there are still qualifications that need to be met. There are still certain preparation that needs to be made and experience that somebody has to have so that they're not a novice and, and all this kind of stuff that the Bible lays out for us in order for somebody to do that. Okay, so not everybody, just because they have a desire, gets to do what it is they have a desire to do. But there's nothing wrong with having that desire. There's nothing wrong with saying, I want to be a pastor one day. I think I, I, think I could do it. I want to serve the Lord. It's not for fame, not for glory. I just want to do it because I feel like it would be the best thing I can do to sacrifice, uh, to, to give my life to God or something like that. 
well then you better keep yourself qualified. <laughs> well then you better train yourself, prepare yourself, uh, you know, talk to men who are in that position so that they can help you get, get ready and be prepared. And maybe it'll be that the Lord one day is going to say, you, now you're ready. I got you. This is your calling. Okay, this is your moment. And maybe that won't happen quite like that. Okay, so I'm gonna, my last point is this. Some people, and I'm talking about people that don't necessarily have that calling on their life. They don't necessarily have that fire and that feeling like, hey, I want to be a bishop one day or something. Some people seem to receive what I would call a secondhand calling. Okay, a secondhand calling. And we used to kind of make fun of, people in Bible college that were like this, okay? Because, you know, it's one thing to be in Bible college and say, hey, why are you in Bible college? You're like, man, the Lord told me that I'm going to be a preacher one day and I got to get training. And so I came here. He led me to this Bible college and he, and he said, hey, this is where you're going to get your training. <laughs> like, you know, if you come there talking like that, well, then you're just like the cream of the crop, you know? And, uh, but if somebody comes in and is like, hey, why did you come to Bible college? Well, my mom said, you know, it's either that or you got to go get a job. <laughs> so I went to Bible college, you know. Uh, does that mean that that person is not going to become a pastor? Well, we used to talk like that. Like that guy has no business being a pastor because he came here secondhand. Like his mom, we, we used to say it this way, mama called, daddy sent. <laughs> you ever heard that? Like mama called me into the ministry and daddy said, Get out of here. I'll give you the money uh, to pay for your college or whatever, but you're going to be a preacher. You're going to be in the ministry. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of pressure are on preachers' kids to be in the ministry um, because it's almost, I've seen in my life where it's almost a shame if somebody's in the ministry and their kids don't go into the ministry. Like, it's like they, you know, praise the Lord. All my kids are saved. Well, I say amen about that. Like, everybody should long for their kids to be saved. And then, uh, and then praise the Lord, like all my kids are serving the Lord in the church in full-time ministry. I've heard that so many times. And if that happens, well, then great. But what if they're not? Like all of a sudden the pressure's on them. If you're, if you're a preacher's kid, that, that like, just, like you're expected that you're going to be in the ministry one day. Look, I've known a lot of preacher's kids, and there's some of them that's like, yeah, it probably shouldn't be <laughs> in full-time ministry. Or, uh, you know, but maybe they will be, maybe they won't be. <clears throat> my desire for my children is the same as your desire should be for your children. I want them to love the Lord. You know, should the Lord allow them to get married and start a family? I want them to be faithful to their family. I want them to be faithful to their church. I want them to have a heart and a desire to serve the Lord in whatever capacity that they can. Okay. I have no ambition that my children are going to be the next pastor and, and they're going to do all these kinds of things. No, I don't. I haven't, I've never even pushed my kids to get heavily involved in soul winning. And some people probably criticize that and be like, why don't you? I mean, you should be pushing them to, because I want them to do the things that they do for the Lord from their heart. Okay, I don't want to make them do it. Now, there's nothing wrong with, t with forcing your kids to do certain things, keeping them in church and, and, and uh, making them memorize Bible verses and do all this kind of thing. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying I personally have tried to shy away from hey, you're my kid and I'm in the ministry, which means that you need to set the example and you need to be like this. I don't want them to have that kind of pressure on them. I just want them to love the Lord and to know that, you know, I'm not looking for them to impress me by being a preacher or a full-time evangelist or, or anything like that. I just want them to serve the Lord and love the Lord and, 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 and obey uh, the Bible, okay? And so at the same time, if a, if a pastor says, Hey, uh, I mean, if a, if a father says, hey, I want you to go to, and you know I'm not big on Bible college. Even though I went to Bible college, I, I, there's a lot of problems with Bible colleges, okay? I would save that message for another day. But I knew a lot of pastors who said, here's what you're going to do. Instead of going off to college somewhere, some university or whatever, after you finish high school, you're going to go to Bible college, like uh, the Bible college of my choice for one year, and I'm going to pay for it and all that. And then after that, you can decide what you want to do. I've heard a lot of people do that. And some of those kids go to Bible college and they end up causing all kinds of problems. <laughs> I've known kids that, you know, were really bad influences at Bible college because they were there under that, you know, kind of a situation. And other people went, hey, I'm here because my mom and dad said I got to take one year. And they ended up becoming pastors, you know, because the opportunity was there. They found out that they, you know, could do certain things that would be beneficial in a church. And so the next thing you know, they went into full-time service somehow. Okay. Some people do receive what we could call a second-hand calling. Now, let's go back to our text in John 1. Same, same passage, okay? We already talked about how Jesus found Peter. I mean, I'm sorry. Jesus found Philip. 
But look at verse 44. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. Uh, and, and he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And we know Nathanael becomes one of the apostles. Okay, But how did he become an apostle? Well, Philip knew him. And when Jesus said, Hey, come, Philip, follow me. Be one of my disciples. He went and found Phil, uh, Nathanael and said, Hey, we found the Messiah. Come and see. And Nathanael's like, Could anything good come out of Nazareth? You're saying this Jesus of Nazareth is the, is the Messiah? Can anything good come out of out of uh so obviously he wasn't already seeking to follow Jesus, you know. He didn't even think that was him. He came out of Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And I like how, how Jesus answers him back. Now, he, obviously Jesus was quite a ways away whenever, uh, whenever Nathaniel asked Philip that question. And so uh, he obviously didn't hear because of what we see. Like it, it seems like Jesus then makes a play on uh, kind of a play, kind of sarcastic. Whenever, whenever uh, Nathaniel comes, he's like, oh, an Israelite. It's kind of like, oh, can anything good come out of Israel? Is what Jesus is asking. He's like, oh, an Israelite in whom is no guile. Like, wow, imagine that. And so, like, there's no doubt in my mind that Nathaniel made that reference and said, well, how does he know that I said that? How does he know I said, oh, what, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, and so regardless, we understand that what happened was he said, wow, Jesus, this is the Son of God. This is Jesus. And, uh, and, and he's like, hey, now I believe. Jesus, of course, is like, hey, you're going to see a whole lot more than that. Just me kind of like seeing you <laughs> before you, when you didn't know that I saw you, you're going to see some, some great things happen. And so from that day forward, Nathaniel follows him and becomes a disciple, okay, which these disciples were full-time service, <laughs> in, in full-time service. Not everybody had to be, but Jesus told these guys, follow me, you know, uh, don't, put, don't look back, you know, put your head to the plow and, 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 and keep following me and and don't worry about your needs don't worry about uh what shall be on the morrow uh don't worry about what am i going to wear what am i going to eat and drink and all that just follow me and nathaniel was one that followed him all because now here's the thing the text shows us that jesus knew <laughs> and jesus said you're going to see greater things than these jesus already knew in his foreknowledge that nathaniel was going to serve him but he didn't go like he did to, to, uh, to Philip and say, hey, follow me. You know, hey, he finds him and says, follow me. And so here's the point that I'm making. Everybody has a call on their life to follow the Lord. But should it happen that circumstances allow you an opportunity to serve the Lord in a full-time capacity as a pastor uh, or whatever? Now, obviously, I'm talking to men. Ladies, you can't be pastors. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, or, or some kind of, maybe you marry a, a, a guy, though, who will be in full-time ministry, and so that makes you full-time ministry in some ways. Uh, whatever the case, like if you end up in that situation, it's not like God was surprised and didn't know that that was going to happen, okay? So my advice then is that everybody considers the possibility that God's going to use you in a way, hey, but I have this dream. I have this ambition. This is what I want to be when I grow up. This is, you know, keep the oper keep the possibility open that God might use you in a different kind of way. And even though you might not get great success and you might not be popular in the world's eyes and you might not have lots of money and all the things you ever dreamed about, keep that option open because you never know how the Lord's going to use you. And the day might very well come when the opportunity comes up and you are find yourself in full-time service. But even if you're not in what we're calling full-time service, you got a full-time job, you got a career, there's certain things that you're doing and you're dedicating your life to for your family and all this kind of stuff. 
you still better follow the Lord with all your heart. Everything you do should be to the glory of God. And, and, and it's not like, well, we're going to save that for the full-time workers. And, uh, and that's, that's not important for me. No, everybody needs to be in the service. Let's go to Matthew 9, and I'm going to finish with this verse here. Although I don't preach really hard on, hey, come forward and surrender your life and give up everything and, and follow the Lord, and I don't preach that way, but you know what? There's, there definitely is a need for it. There definitely is a need for men and women to stand up and say, like, I'm going to give everything. I'm going to totally be dedicated to the Lord should he allow me to serve him in that capacity. Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Look, we know just trying to reach, which, which compared to the rest of the world, like, the, you know, on a scale between the, the whole world, like Kansas City is a relatively pretty small place, right? But just the massive undertaking that it is to reach Kansas City and to knock on every door and to be able to, you know, get people in here and get them discipled and, and, and train them to go out with us and, and, and all those kinds of things. Just every once in a while to just look at that massive scale and see how big of a job that is. It's just like, hey, you get moved with compassion. You're like, man, the harvest is great. And the laborers are few. Okay. And of course, we have a lot of laborers that are going out preaching the gospel and all and, and, and doing what they can. And I praise the Lord for a church where we got so many people just working full time jobs and raising families and the families are growing and all that. And yet they still make it out for soul winning. They still make it to church. They still, uh, you know, talk to their coworkers and do all they can for the Lord. But you know what? I'm still praying the Lord of the harvest. I'm still praying, Lord, send us laborers. Send people, you know, raise up some of these kids that we're having, that, you know, these, we're pr producing more children. Praise the Lord. Hey, we, we, we don't care if they're doctors and lawyers and physicians and, and uh, whatever. You know, we want them to serve the Lord. Now, I'm not going to put pressure on them and say they have to do that or they're not right with God, but we want more laborers. We want people to come in here and be, and be like, you know, here's some ideal situations. Like, you know, there are some people that they, they retire from the military, and, and they got a pretty good pension coming in. They got, uh, you know, hey, praise the Lord. This is a good opportunity to do a little bit more for the Lord and have more uh, time where you don't have to be out working the full-time job and doing all these kinds of things. Again, I'm not against people working 12-hour days. I think that you should be. If, if, if you have a family and uh, you got to pay the bills, then obviously you should be out there working and doing all that. But just keep that possibility open that the Lord might use you in full-time service because we we definitely need it and look someone who's going to be a pastor can't be a novice which means they're going to have to keep themselves qualified for the ministry for quite a while you know how, how old is a, a i promise i'm almost done how old is does a president have to be before they can be president anybody remember no is it 40 because i know there's not never been a president younger than the, than 40 do you know what it is? Did you say? 35, 40, 35, is it 35? 35? Okay. But I don't think there's ever been a president. I looked it up recently. I don't think there's ever been a president that was younger than 40. I think it was like 43 or the youngest one. And that's only like one. Okay. Now, last couple of years, we got some guys that are way on the other extreme. <laughs> okay. But most guys uh, that have become president were like 50. Okay. Now, I, uh, not too long ago, was ref referencing some of the Levites, a particular passage that talked about uh, some of the Levites went into their ministry at 30 and retired at 50. Okay, now I'm not saying that that's some kind of a guideline that we have to follow. I'm just saying if you think about that, like they couldn't go into the ministry until they were 30. 
I know like 19 year olds who have sold out. Like I don't want to serve the Lord. I want to be a pastor. And I'm not saying a guy couldn't be a pastor before he's 30, uh, but it kind of makes sense. You know, Jesus began his public ministry at 30. Like, like when you're 30 years old, it's like, okay, this person has like demonstrated that they can work hard, demonstrated that they can follow authority, demonstrated that they can be patient and long suffering and all these kinds of things. And so now they're ready to go into the ministry. And then you got guys my age that are looking at the, the, twilight of my, you know, like if, if, if I'm using 50 as an example, like 50 years old, I might, I might have to retire. You know, there's, that's just showing you though, that there has to be a maturity there in sense of like, Hey, you put in the time and the work and the effort. And so it's one thing to be a young man and say like, yeah, I want to be in the ministry. And then be like, man, I, I don't want to have to wait. <laughs> and so like, so, so, you know, like it's going to be years of being patient and dedicating yourself to the Lord and and knowing your Bible and, and doing all these things. And I'm going to tell you, I, I don't say that as if like, hey, look at me as the ultimate example. I wish I would have done more in preparation for when I became a pastor. It was just like, whoa, how did this happen? You know, it shouldn't have been a surprise since I was nine years old. I had known that I was going to do this with my life. And yet whenever it happened, it was like, oh, man, I sure wish I would have been trying harder and paying more attention, do more soul winning and, and read my Bible more and memorize verses more. Because you never know when it's going to come upon you. And that opportunity is going to be there. But you need to be ready because we need laborers. And we need uh, Christian workers. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this church and the great opportunity we have here with young men, young women who are dedicated to doing your service at whatever capacity you'll allow them to. Uh, and I pray, Lord, that you would somehow use this church um, for many years to come as we uh, uh, certainly do see the end coming, uh, but we want to make sure that, that we do the work and we need to labor in the, in the harvest field, Lord. And I pray that, um, that you would raise up some men and women and call them into the ministry, uh, maybe some others that don't feel that desire, that burden, Lord, but they're capable and they're qualified. Uh, Lord, that you would use them and that they would have a heart that's soft and ready to be used um, at a moment's notice in that capacity. And Lord, we know that many churches could be started. And we know many churches without uh, pastors uh, could use pastors. And many um, just possibilities are out there if we only had the laborers. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to, um, to be patient as we wait for that and do all that we can, even if we stretch ourselves a little bit more to do the work of, of, uh, of two people or three people. I pray, Lord, that you help us do that. But we do pray that you would send laborers to help us out. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.